Hi everyone and welcome to everybody joining us for this which is the first of our webinars for 2015 that discusses Linux State products with a focus on their features and applications. Uh, for those of you who haven't attended one of our webinars before, my name's Tom Pritchard, I'm the host for today's session. I'll be introducing you to our first speaker shortly and also presenting the second section and wrapping up at the end. Today's webinar is titled Automated at Last Yield Line Analysis Using Linux State Slab and it will provide you with an overview of how you can apply our new yield line software, Limit Slate Slab, to a wide range of slab analysis problems. The topics for today are firstly an overview of how the software works, which will be presented by Professor Matthew Gilbert, and then a practical application of the software to a range of slab analysis problems, which will be presented by myself. Um, as ever, for those of you who have been with us before, the webinar is due to last about an hour, and it will include five or ten minutes at the end for questions. These can be posted by the question functionality that's present in the webinar interface that you should all have on your screens. We do try to answer as many of the questions as we can in the time available, but sometimes it's not always possible, so we're very sorry if we don't get around to actually answering yours. But if you do have a technical question that may take some time to answer, you're more than welcome to contact us outside of the webinar via info at limitstate.com, and we'll be happy to answer these in some detail for you. So without further delay, I'd like you to welcome you to our first speaker today who is Professor Matthew Gilbert and he'll be speaking about the methodology of automating the yield line analysis. Uh, I'll now pass you over to him. Thanks very much Tom and uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. So first thing to do is to just uh, show you a few images of what we're, what we're actually talking about. The yield line method is a long established method for um, analyzing slabs. In general, it's been quite difficult to apply it to complicated slabs. So the first image shows some simple slabs with familiarly yield line patterns and on the right some more complex slabs um, with clearly more complex uh, patterns. And the next slide shows um, how we can visualize those using the animation functionality in the software. So that's key development is allowing the basic yield line method to be applied to more complicated um, problems. Okay, before we uh, um, get into the meat of the presentation, just a few words about uh, about Limit State. Um, it's actually uh, a spin-out company from the University of Sheffield, uh, spun out in 2006, and the key thing that we're doing is commercializing academic research and making available to engineers powerful software for ultimate limit state analysis and design applications. And what we're doing is applying state of the optimization technology, um, techniques that are not used in common engineering analysis and design software. And as a spin-up company, it's possible to make sure we've got robust, well-validated software and also well-supported software as, as kind of Tom intimated. In terms of existing products, um, we've got a masonry arch bridge application called Limit State Ring, which uh, is our first uh, first product that we, we launched back in probably 2007, and Limit State Geo, which is a geotechnical analysis software, uh, launched uh, a year or two later. And those products are now used in more than 30 countries worldwide by many leading UK uh, consultants uh, and contractors. So um, here's a, a sort of... Uh, a snapshot of our clients page on our website, you can see some uh, some, some big names, Acom, Amy, Arup, Atkins, Balfour Beatty and so forth. So widely used uh, software. In terms of what, what drives us, um, I guess the, the, the fundamental thing is that whereas linear elastic analysis tools have become ubiquitous, they've become very easy to use, mainstream, we can apply them to problems of any geometry. Conversely, the rigid plastic uh, um, analysis um, situation is quite different, tools are much less well developed, um, many people are still uh, using hand calculation tools, um, perhaps automated in, in simple spreadsheets or, or software applications. So, our, our motivation has been to try to um, level the playing field and provide rigid plastic analysis tools which uh, um, you know much much more well developed in case you're, you're not clear uh, about 
what I'm talking about here, rigid plastic uh, limit analysis tools are used to directly estimate the, the maximum load which can be carried by a body or structure. And what we're doing is using a very simple idealization where we assume there's no deformation prior to collapse and then we have perfect plasticity um, at collapse. And if you're thinking about uh, ultimate um, analysis, then there are key benefits compared with elastic methods. Uh, and those benefits are that you tend to get much more economical solutions when you're thinking of a design scenario and you're thinking about an assessment or analysis uh, scenario, then you can find hidden reserves of strength very often. So just uh, to wrap, wrap this bit up, um, if we think of some basic application, so for example geotechnical application, and what we've tended to have as a polarization of the types of analysis tools that are available to practitioners. We've had hand calculations which are perhaps automated in spreadsheets or simple software on the one side and we've had nonlinear finite elements on the other and there's been a, a major gap uh, between those two types of tools. And what we're basically doing is filling that gap with numerical rigid plastic uh, analysis tools. And so in the geotechnical scenario, clearly we're talking about uh, um, filling that gap with limit state geo um, for masonry arch bridges. We're filling that gap with um, limit state ring. And now um, with the new launch of limit state slab, we're able to uh, um, try to fill that gap with um, an automated yield land analysis tool, um, as you can see in the, uh, the central image there. So if we just um, go back to um, um, basics with concrete slabs, um, the yield line method will be familiar to many of you. It, it may not be familiar to all of you. Certainly not all university syllabuses cover yield line method uh, these days. Um, the term yield line was coined um, probably 80, 90 years ago in, in a paper published in the structural engineer. And then the key developer of the technology was Johansson in Denmark, who developed a, a very wide-ranging theory uh, which allowed yield line method to be used to analyze slabs of, of varying um, shapes and sizes and, and the like. And it was later shown that Johansson's yield line method was actually uh, an upper bound plastic analysis method. Um, so in the 1950s, plastic methods became much more well developed and the understanding um, grew quite quite markedly at that time. In terms of the calculations, um, typically what you do if you're doing a hand-based yield line analysis is that you um, decide what is a likely failure mechanism or yield line pattern. You um, then um, deform that mechanism and use the work method to actually calculate how much applied load would be required in order to cause collapse. So we've got some, some calculations taken from uh, the Kennedy and Goodchild uh, yield line design um, document published by the Concrete Center some years ago. Um, quite often, um, you wouldn't fix the geometry. You would actually have some feature of the geometry as a variable, and then you would um, try to find the um, the worst case, i.e., the, the most critical yield line pattern. But generally, you would make an assumption about the form of the mechanism, and that mechanism may or may not be uh, the critical one. So in terms of um, the benefits of, or the pros of the yield line method, it's a simple, direct way of estimating the collapse load, leads to economical designs and realistic assessments of capacity of, of slabs. The downside is clearly if you don't choose the correct mechanism, then you will get the wrong answer and because it's an upper bound method you will get an unsafe prediction of the carrying capacity of the slab. Other disadvantages um, compared with for example non-linear finite elements is um, 
you're only considering one aspect of slab behavior. You're considering flexural failure. You're not considering shear failure, and you're not considering um, service deflections prior to collapse. Um, that said, um, there was renewed interest in, in yield line method, certainly in the 90s and, and 2000s. So at Cambridge, Middleton and co-workers showed um, that many concrete bridges had hidden reserves of strength. So you can see with this uh, um, bar chart here, we've got the elastic assessment of, of a given bridge shown in red and the plastic assessment shown in green. And you can see that there's a big, a big difference, i.e. many bridges which are predicted using elastic methods to be uh, inadequate are actually um, demonstrated to be adequate um, using plastic methods. And uh, in, the, in the 90s, um, um, Middleton um, and co-workers produced uh, the Cobra software, which basically um, cranked through I think you've got 27 failure mechanisms and identified which of those was the most critical um, for a concrete uh, slab um, or beam and slab bridge. The disadvantage, however, is that there's always the worry that there's a mechanism 28 or 29 which isn't on this list, which is actually critical for your, your geometry. Um, similar time. Um, the Cardington building project um, indicated that yield line methods could be used um, in a design context and would generally predict that you would need significantly lower amounts of reinforcement. And also, uh, this is indicating about a second column, um, significantly simpler um, layouts of reinforcement. So less and simpler um, clearly uh, converts uh, to quite significant cost savings potentially when you're using the yield line method in new design. And they produced a, a document in 2004, Practical Yield Line Design. Forward says yield line design is so easy, but then the caveat is once you know what you're doing. And the reality is many people um, found it very difficult to to actually uh, um, be confident that they, they they were identifying critical mechanisms and found it difficult to uh, apply that in the design setting. So what we've done is automated the yield line method. And what I'll do is before we get into the how it works, I'll just actually show what I'm talking about through the limit state slab software. Um, so Tom will talk about this in a bit more detail, but I'm just going to start off with a very simple example, which I'm just going to, um, um, I'm basically going to draw a geometry from scratch on the screen. I'm going to apply some properties and click solve. And you'll get a feeling for um, how easy it is to um, analyze a, a non-standard geometry, a geometry which you might spend a good deal of time scratching your head over, head over if you were doing this by hand. So um, I've got a, a unsymmetrical, clearly an unsymmetrical um, slab. Um, I'm going to choose the, the boundary conditions. Let's say that we've got simple supports. Um, I'm going to apply a um, material. I'm going to um, apply a pressure loading. And I now have um, everything I need in order to um, do an analysis of this slab. And if I click solve, then what the software is doing is trying to find the critical yield line mechanism. If I click this animation button, then I can see how this um, slam, slab is going to deform in practice. So you can see in the space of, um, you know, probably less than a minute or so, 
I was able to create a slab and, um, and do the analysis. In terms of the, the output, Tom will talk a bit more about this uh, later on, but what we're doing is actually we've got the verbose output on here, which um, um, you won't normally see, but uh, what we've got is an adequacy factor on the applied load of 3.85. So I actually had a unit load on here, and it's saying that uh, that needs to be multiplied by 3.85 uh, in order to cause collapse of the slab. Okay, so how do we how do we do the um, the automation? That's the, that's the sort of the key thing. Lots of people have tried to automate the the method. Um, as long ago as um, the early 70s, um, a guy called um, Henry Chan, working at Oxford University, um, proposed that you could use rigid finite elements with potential yield lines at the edges of those finite elements. And then you could use optimization to find the critical um, arrangement of yield lines. The problem was that the topology of the finite elements has a big influence on the, the outcome. And unless you arrange your your elements in, for example, a radial mesh, it's going to be very difficult to get, for example, a fan-type mechanism. Um, some development work was carried out more recently, for example, in the 90s, um, where you use the, the Chan-type method to get an initial solution, and then you move nodes around in order to improve the solution. But still didn't get over the problem of, for example, identifying fan-type mechanisms. So when we came to this, we, we realized that there were other numerical methods which could identify, for example, fan-type mechanisms. And one such method um, is in a completely different field, trust layout optimization. And if you're not familiar with that, um, if you just switch well away from slabs, imagine that you have a... A, a, a trust design problem, you have um, support conditions and a design domain and a load, and what you're trying to do is work out what's the most efficient truss um, to carry the given load. What we do in trust load optimization is we populate the design domain with nodes. We can have a moderate number of nodes, or we can have a fewer nodes. And we connect those nodes together with potential trust bars or connections in general, and we use optimization to find um, the most um, optimum subset of connections or most optimal subset of trust bars. If we only started off with a few nodes, we end up with very simple trust designs. If we have more nodes, then we have more connections, we have um, more complex um, topologies possible. And you can see the final um, image on the screen is of effectively a, a fan type mechanism, that, although we've only just got a, a quarter of the, the whole fan. Turns out that um, if you, instead of uh, considering um, um, external applied loads, if you, if you think of this as a, a self-stress problem or pre-stress problem, then actually we can... Um, simulate the full fan type form that we, we associate in, in, in slabs with applied point loads. And this was something that um, Denton um, um, discovered in probably about uh, 2000, 2001. So in terms of the problem formulation, if we stay with um, trusses, what we're trying to do in the truss design problem is minimize the volume. And the, minim uh, the volume is simply the sum of all the the lengths of the bars times the um, the areas. Um, rearranging that, you can um, say that it's the sum of the, the length of the yield stress times the bar forces. And the constraints are nodal equilibrium. So we're just looking at the X and Y direction equilibrium at nodes. In terms of the, um, the self-stress problem, which is actually closer to the problems that we're dealing with in, in, in slab analysis, then all we're doing is we're removing the external applied load from the, the, the middle constraint, and we, we're having another constraint which applies to self-stress. 
For the slab problem, it turns out it's pretty much identical to this, except the quantities are different. So mathematically, it's identical, except for instead of dealing with bar forces, we're considering um, rotations at yield lines. Instead of considering equilibrium, we're considering compatibility. Instead of self-stress, we're considering uh, virtual work and a unit displacement. The key thing, and you don't need to be too worried about, about this when you're using the software, the key thing though is that they're very easy problems to solve mathematically and that's why we can get solutions very quickly. Just uh, look at the compatibility constraint briefly. If we zoom in on a node, we've got five yield lines coming into that node. What we're doing is basically um, summing up the yield line rotations at each of the five converging yield lines and we're resolving those in the x direction and the y direction and um, they must sum to zero. So in other words, if we start at one particular point, we go round the outside of the, the node and come back, then we must uh, end up where we started from with the same rotation. And a key kind of feature is that um, compatibility is enforced at, at nodes, but it's also implicitly enforced at crossover points. So when we connect each node to every other node, we have many, many crossover points. This constraint is already um, implicitly enforced. We don't need to have a, a node at that point. Okay, so move on to some examples. This is uh, an early example that we looked at, a very academic one. Uh, the reason we looked at it is because we have a, an exact solution for this problem. This is a square slab with fixed supports. We're actually looking at an eighth of it. And we have a solution from literature of 42.851. We're able to solve this uh, problem using our technique called discontinuity optimization um, to almost all significant figures. So we're just incorrect in the last significant figure there. And actually, if we solve bigger and bigger problems and extrapolate, then actually we, we find that the extrapolated value is, is correct to all five significant figures. So that gives us confidence that the, the numbers are correct. We're actually, we've got a method which is, is capable of um, uh, getting um, correct solutions. Uh, a slightly more practical problem from the literature, one that was considered um, by a number of workers, including Jackson. Uh, we have um, an indented slab with simple and fixed supports, solution given 29.2. We actually came up with a, um, a slightly improved solution, 28.988, um, although the trade-off is, you can see, it's geometrically more complex. And that's something that we did look at and we're considering implementing in the, in the limit state slab software, haven't yet, and that's uh, allowing the user to simplify the, the solution. So the solution um, corresponding with A on this figure that you can see now is more accurate than the solution you can see in F. On the other hand, if you're doing a hand check, then the solution in F is certainly much easier to hand check than, than A. So it's something that uh, if there's demand, we'll, we'll make this available. A slightly more uh, um, realistic example now, this is an apartment block. This is one that was considered in the, the concrete center guide. Um, and the reason it's considered there is because the, the geometric shape of the floor slab is quite complex and in the design guide there's quite a lot of uh, coverage of um, this particular example lots of different potential failure mechanisms to consider and also for this particular example there's a suggestion that uh, whatever solution you you find you actually apply a margin of safety of 15 percent just to take account of the the likelihood that you you haven't managed to uh, pin down the exact um, critical mechanism. 
with the software. Um, very easy to um, to set up this this kind of problem um, and, and and solve it. And you can see the software will go straight to the critical failure mechanism. So there's no need to consider manually many many failure mechanisms. You can rely on the software to find the the critical one directly. Okay, so just just moving on to the close of my kind of introductory part of the uh, the webinar. A um, few conclusions: Yieldline method is a powerful method. It's fallen out of use primarily because um, there hasn't been a, a, a general computer-based implementation. It's stayed as a hand-based tool. The automated method is has been implemented. We can get solutions very quickly and we can solve problems um, irrespective of the, of the potential failure mechanisms that we might find. So in other words, we can find fan mechanisms or whatever other mechanism type might be critical. And obviously the software is now available um, for you to try uh, via the Limits Data website. Okay, so I'm going to hand over now to, to Tom who's going to tell you a little bit more about the Limits Data Slab software and uh, apply it to uh, a variety of examples. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so yeah, Matthew has gone through the process of um, how the software actually works behind the scenes. I'll be just guiding you through a few worked examples, uh, some sort of um, complex, some quite simple, just to show how it's going to work. Firstly, I'll just introduce you to the software interface um, and the wizards and the general usage, and then go on to an arbitrary geometry, and then lastly, a more complex geometry, similar to the one that Matthew has just shown. So if we bring the software back, you see Matthew is still there. The first thing to do is probably just to introduce you to the software interface. So you can see in the middle here is obviously the viewer, and then it's like most bits of software. You've got the menu system at the top, and then the toolbars, which allow you to do the different things. So if I just open a very basic problem, you can see on the left-hand side here, we've got things that allow you to just draw new bits of geometry onto there. Also, the purple buttons allowing to apply loading, um, et cetera, et cetera. The parts that are probably the most useful to the end users are the ones if you select a zone in the problem. On the right-hand side, anything that you select will have all the properties displayed in the property editor where you can go in and change things as necessary. Um, so you can change potentially the uh, material properties or the spacing of the nodes or the geometry of something um, using that. Uh, similarly, if you click on the material in this what we call the slab definitions on the left hand side here, on the right hand side in the property editor, you get to see all of the properties for the MP values and the thickness and the unit weight, etc. on the right there. So there are a few ways of setting up problems within Limit State Slab. Uh, I'll just quickly go through all three of them today. The first way is to actually use a wizard. So what we have is just a couple of different ones here. The first one is a rectangular slab, which allow you to set up either, as it says, a rectangle or a skewed rectangular slab. The first of the uh, dialog windows is just the general project settings, so you can see just normal stuff like the project name, your name, and any sort of comments and things that you may wish to add to it to come to later. At the bottom, if you are on the Windows machine, you can add tags to it to allow you to find the, the file later on. Then we come in, uh, actually setting up the problem itself. The first window is the geometry window where you're allowed to set up the dimensions um, and also the skew angle if you wish to, and also set up the boundary conditions so for this problem, what I'm going to do is just change to simple supports all the way around. Obviously, you've got the choice here between free, symmetry, fixed, and simple supports. But as mentioned, I'm going to make them all simple. Now, you come on to actually the slab definitions or the materials in the problem. Um, there are a few that are built in. But what we want to do here is actually create a new one ourselves. We'll just call it new slab definition one. And we'll make it a different color. 
just so that it's distinguishable from the others. And then we've got the properties on the right hand side here. And in Limit States Lab, what we do is we define the MP values and the direction in which they act. So they're always taken normal to the rebar direction. So in this case, um, what we're looking at here is just an isotropic material. And I think I'm going to keep it like that for the time being. Then the next tab here is the loading tab. And what you can do is apply different types of loading to it. So we've got self-weight loads, pressure loads, which in this wizard are applied by default to all of the zones within it. Uh, and you can also apply line loads and point loads, which we'll come on to shortly. Then lastly, as Matthew mentioned in his presentation, um, you can change the nodal density within problems in order to make this um, solve either quicker or more accurate. What we tend to do is keep things on a medium nodal density, which includes 500 nodes in it. And that is a good compromise between speed and accuracy. So click Finish. After we have the dialogue just telling you a little about how to solve the thing. If we click Solve button, what we'll see is the software going through and identifying the critical yield line pattern for this particular problem. And as you can see, it's homing in on a traditional envelope type failure mechanism with an adequacy factor on the applied load of 1.22. Now that just means that the unit pressure load that we applied within the wizard is multiplied up 1.22 times before a collapse will occur. Once we've got the failure mechanism, what we can do is then animate it to actually see how the particular problem is failing and also sort of rotate it and inspect it from any angle that we wish. So that was quite a simple thing. Um, what we might want to do is actually, and I'll need to solve it again, is produce a report. So if you want to sort of show it to a client or something like that. So once it's solved, you can also in the analysis menu, go to the report and you get the options of what you want to include within your report. And you can see here, it's just an overview of all the different project settings, including a picture of the critical failure mechanism and also the critical adequacy factor that's been identified. But perhaps the most sort of interesting thing is being able to just play about with the models and introduce sort of more realistic and new features into it. So one of the first things we might want to do is make the slab definition um, orthotropic rather than isotropic. So if you see here in the left hand side, we take our slab definition, we can see we've got two angles of rebar here. So first and second, if I just change the first so that the MP value is actually five kilonewton meters per meter rather than one as it was previously, and then solve the problem again. If you remember the envelope failure pattern from the, the first solve had quite a small horizontal section in the middle of it here. We can see that now we've changed the, the MP values within our slab definition. The failure mechanism has changed by expanding that horizontal yield line. And also corresponding to that, the adequacy factor has now risen sort of quite dramatically. Obviously, we've increased the uh, strength in one direction by a factor of five. So the adequacy factor that we've now discovered is 3.77 rather than the 1.22 from before. So other things we might want to do, and I'm just going to make this back into an isotropic material. We might want to potentially add a column in somewhere. So it's very easy to do in the software. We just choose one of these draw buttons on the left hand side here. We can either have a rectangle or a polygon, depending on what we want to do. And just draw a square there, delete the center of it. And in the property editor, we just select that square, select the external boundaries, change the support type to fixed. You can see now that we've got the cross hatching in there that's telling us that those external boundaries are now fixed. And we can solve again.
what we get is an entirely different um, failure mechanism. It's more like a, an envelope on the right-hand side of the slab there. And again, the adequacy factor has changed. It's reduced slightly now um, from when we had the orthotropic material, but it's actually increased from when we had no column in the center of it. So now the value is 2.67. We might want to potentially move that column about. So what I'll do is I'll just drag it over to the left a little, solve again, see what happens to the failure mechanism and the associated adequacy factor. As we can see there, the adequacy factor has gone down by moving that column to the left because the area that's involved in the failure mechanism is larger on the right-hand side there. So another one of the things that we may want to do, if I unlock here, is change the boundary conditions around the edges of the slab. So if I select these two here, again in the property editor, just go to the external boundaries and make those free. Now they have no support whatsoever, um, so we can solve again and see if the failure mechanism is different. And as you can see here it is, we're getting more of a, a fan with the free edges sort of attracting the yield line pattern and the adequacy factor here has gone right down again. So we may want to add another column just to see whether that actually helps us to get the adequacy factor back up again. So again all it is is a case of drawing a square on the right hand side, selecting the boundaries around the edge of it, making them fixed and solving. And just by doing that we can see that we've actually sort of effectively nearly doubled the capacity of the slab. The adequacy factor has gone up from 1.2 to 2.25. So that's a very quick sort of introduction to setting up problems using the wizard and just showing you how you can very quickly make modifications to the problems that you've set up using the functionality within the software. One of the other ways of actually generating your model is to start as Matthew did previously with an empty wizard so basically just a grid on the screen and define your geometry and materials manually from scratch rather than using one of the built-in geometries from the, the wizard system. So here we just made a nice sort of cruciform shape. I'll make the boundaries all simple. And what we need to do now is actually generate a material. So if I create a new slab definition, we'll call it slab definition one, give it a color. And then as mentioned previously, what we're doing is looking at rebar in two directions and for this case, I'll just keep it as an isotropic material. So now our new slab definition has appeared there and all it is is a case of either dragging it onto the geometry and dropping it or alternatively if you simply select that zone, you can see in the right hand side in the property editor here, it's saying our slab definition is in there. What we can do is click the change button and either unassign or assign whichever slab definition we wish to that particular solid zone. So we've got material, we've got boundary conditions. The last thing we need on there is some loading. So what we can do is come to these buttons here, click the pressure loading, It'll say add a new load. And in this case, I'm just going to select them all, which is just that single geometry there. Click OK and it's going to add a unit pressure load to that solid there. And for this particular case there will be unity partial factors applied to it so there's nothing um, except being a sort of a straight multiplier on that pressure load for the adequacy factor. So now we've got all the things that are required for the problem to be able to solve.
we've got the boundary conditions, we've got the slab definition and we've got the loading. So we can just click solve and it will very quickly come up with a nice yield line pattern that again we can animate and rotate and inspect. If we go back to the basic overhead view of it, what we can also do once the problem is solved is click on the different areas and you can see what the moments along each of the edges of these different solid zones is. So again we set up something very quickly just from scratch but like, the beauty of the software is that you can then just make changes very quickly as you wish. So in our case here what I want to understand is what happens if I support all of these corners with columns. So I'm going to select all of these and provide support to the external boundaries around our newly defined columns, solve the problem and see what effect that has. So we can see now we've got a slightly more complex failure mechanism and the accuracy factor has gone up from 11.7 up to 15.3. The next thing I want to actually investigate is what happens if maybe I take out the support conditions along some of the edges, make those free. So now we're providing less restraint to the problem. Solve again, see what the failure pattern is. And it's a much simpler um, sort of standard straight line failure pattern. And the adequacy factor is reduced dramatically as you may expect by reducing the amount of support that's provided to the problem. You can also do is simply just drag the geometry around if you want to see what the result of making the slab a lot bigger might be. So in my case, I'm just going to widen each of the arms of this cross shape. To something like that. And solve and see what the effect on the failure pattern and the adequacy factor might be. And you can see for this case, it's actually quite a nice sort of, uh, petal shaped failure mechanism coming in from each of the four columns. And in this case, the adequacy factor on the applied load has gone down from 3.2 to 2.5, purely because the area of the slab has, has got bigger. So the last case I want to look at here is sort of the third way of generating a problem within the limit state slab software. So we've had a look at looking at the wizard, looking at drawing things by hand. The last case is something that's a little bit more realistic, so something that may take a little bit more time to set up within the problem, what you can do is actually import a geometry from a DXF file. So I can do that, I can just go to import geometry and this is something I've already set up by drawing it in a CAD package and saving as a DXF, just a basic collection of lines. And what the software does is then interprets all of those lines and creates solid zones out of any closed loop that it finds. So in our case here, what we've got is an apartment block. And on the right and the left hand side, we've got some cantilevers. And then everything in the middle 
is being held up by columns. So what we want to do would be to go through and just make all of our squares into columns. So if I just select them and delete, it's telling me there that it couldn't delete a boundary which I'd also selected at the same time as some of the solids, but we can see now all these zones here have no material in them, so now what we can do is apply a boundary condition to them. So if I select all of these, what we don't want to select, oh, excuse me, is the internal boundaries. I go to the property editor, select the external boundaries there, make them fixed, and see after a few seconds what will happen is that they will all become fixed. Actually, I've accidentally made that one at the edge fixed there. So we've got our geometry, we've put in our boundary conditions. Then what we want to do is go through and specify new slab definitions for each of the different areas. So we may have uh, stairs, we may have sort of a main floor slab, we may have a kitchen, a bathroom, things like that. Um, and as I demonstrated earlier, you can do that just by going to new slab definition here and making something that may be main floor slab. Give it a color. And again, put your properties in. And then once you've done that, you can just drag and drop as necessary onto your problem. So I'm, in the best sort of traditions of Blue Peter, what I'm going to do is actually open a file that I made earlier, which is that same apartment block, but with all the different slab definitions actually applied to it. So we've got here stairs, toilet, main floor, and the balconies, which are sort of cantilevering off the edges, as we explained previously. So the last thing we need to do in this problem is apply some loading to it. So what we have in Limit State Slab is what we call the Load Case Manager, and all that does is combines predefined loads with predefined partial factor sets and makes it into a load case. And you can have as many of these as you like. So for things like uh, bridge problems and, and stuff like that, you can actually define loads and then move them around if you wish, or if you've got different partial factor sets that you wish to test one particular structure for, you can apply them. Um, all in the same problem, and then it will work out which one is the critical out of all of those. So for our model here, we've already got some pressure loading set up. So we can see here, we've got the kitchen, toilet, stair, and main pressure loads. Um, and they're applied to different sections of the model. We've got a partial safety factor of unity on everything. So all I need to do now, if I go up here, you can actually see these pressure loads all applied in the problem. And then solving will go through and determine what the critical failure mechanism is for it. And again, we can animate it just to get a better understanding of how the slab is potentially failing. So that brings me pretty much to the end of this section of the webinar. Um, we have some time now if there are any questions. We shall have a look. And actually, I think it's probably uh, appropriate if I pass you over to Matthew to answer some of these questions for us. Thanks, Tom. So um, just looking at the questions, we've got one question. Drop-in slab is quite common, so drop slabs in the building and may affect stress distribution. Can this be modelled? Um, yes is the answer, uh, although it would need to be manually specified. So in other words, you, you specify a, a, a zone around the column and you can allocate different properties to that. Um, Final element. Method can model slab of odd geometry and provide stress contours. All solve 
within minutes. Can LS Slab match or better this? So what we're basically doing is we're allowing, um, we're leveling the playing field. So yes, you can model an odd geometry and you can um, solve the problem very, very quickly. So in that sense, it's the same as an elastic analysis. It isn't as, um, currently we don't have um, a, a built-in plugin for reinforcement design, so that's that's a difference because we're at an earlier stage of the, the sort of development of technology. However, the key thing, and it's what we hear from many engineers, is that um, elastic finite element-based um, designs tend to require, you know, lots of, re or tend to involve lots of reinforcement over supports, and um, so complex reinforcement distributions and large amounts of reinforcement. So yield line design potentially um, you can you can reduce that. Um, another question: How can we ap apply bridge specific loading? Is there a predefined library that comes with the software? Um, Tom, have you got a um, a bridge example you could um, you could open up? Yes. Um, so the, while Tom's Tom's doing that, we we, we we wanted to make available the technology as soon as possible, so what we've done is, is made a sort of a vanilla software application which allows you to um, you know, apply loads, arbitrary geometries and all, all the rest of it. What we haven't done is focused the software either on the um, design of new buildings or on the um, um, assessment of bridges specifically. Um, you can do it and um, um, but it will take a little bit longer than, um, than, for example, if you're using one of our other software packages, say Limit State Ring, which is um, clearly purely for bridges and has a built-in library of vehicles. So I'm not sure Tom's doing something. Um, he, we've just, I think Tom's just opened a, a beam and slab example and um, the, a, a vehicle um, actually going to be moving across the bridge. Um, just looking at more questions. Um, can slab depth be varied linearly across its span width? Okay, we haven't thought of that. Um, so what you could do is you could have a series of different um, um, slab um, definitions across the, um, the span. If there's demand, we could very, very easily with the, the methodology that we're using actually um, take that into, into consideration, but it, it's not there in the, in the current version. Um, I'm looking at other questions. How much are license costs? Um, that's um, something that um, you should be able to find that on the, uh, on, on the website. So if you go to limitstate.com slash slab, and then I think there is a price schedule. So I think um, so. Basic license um, three one sixty UK pounds sterling is is what's just come up on the screen. Um, another question, actually, the first question I've just noticed that can slab with shear wall be modelled for horizontal load? Um, you can apply. There's no need for the slab that you're, you're dealing with to be horizontal. On the other hand, clearly we're using plastic methods, so we've got to be talking about um, relatively lightly reinforced element in order to um, um, comply with the uh, assumptions of um, plastic analysis. Um, could one use this? In theory, to analyze hydrostatic loading on concrete walls of water retaining structures. Absolutely, although generally, in my experience of water retaining structures is um, serviceability, crack width um, criteria tend to come into the fore um, for obvious reasons. But I guess if you're using a non ferrous reinforcement and uh, you had good sealing material, then that, then that could be could be possible. Um, do we need to calculate the plastic moment capacity first and add the input to check adequacy factor? In relation to the first, it, yeah, in, the, in, the, in this version, um, we're 
um, requiring the user to specify the plastic movement capacity. That can be specified in um, in two directions, and you can have um, you can vary the angle away from 90 degrees. So you can have skew reinforcement and orthotropic reinforcement. Um, just looking at, I wasn't exactly following what Tom was doing on the um, on the software, but um, have you got it in, in bridge mode, Tom? Um, okay, so so actually, it's not gonna. Um, the, just going back to the question about bridges, there is a bridge mode, so you can actually. Um, if we we didn't we didn't add the software into that, where you can actually very easily um, see see the different mechanisms as as a vehicle traverses um, the bridge. Okay, just uh, look. Some other uh, questions. Um, um, can we analyze box culvert, which is lightly reinforced? Um, so I, I guess you can um, um, model the various elements of a box culvert. At the moment, you can only model um, elements which lie on a plane, so you can model um, um, the walls and the um, and and the, the base slab and the uh, the upper upper slab of a box culvert. Um, I'm just looking at the see if there's any other questions. I think we've covered most of the questions. Are there any other questions you can see there, Tom? Okay, so um, I'll pass you back to Tom to uh, to wrap things up. Thanks, Matthew, and thanks everyone for attending the webinar. We hope you found it informative. And as mentioned at the start, if the presentations raise any questions that we haven't answered uh, in that last bit there, then please do get in touch via telephone or by emailing us on info at limitstate.com, and we'll be happy to answer those questions for you. Um, Limit State Slab is available to download or purchase now from the website, which is www.limitstate.com, and we'll also be in touch with each of you over the next few days just to get some feedback on the webinar and find out if you have any further questions or see whether you think Limit State Slab might actually be useful for you. Um, if you'd like to watch the webinar again, or if you think you might know somebody who would be interested to see it, there'll be a recording available later on, hopefully today. We'll email you with a link once it's available online. There are also um, other webinars this evening and in a couple of weeks time which will uh, go through the same things again so if somebody that you do know wanted to watch it and also ask questions then they could do that also um, also if you could please look out for our other webinars dealing with Limit State Slab and uh, other software products we'll be sending out event notifications via email in advance of these and they'll also be posted on our website um, at limitstate.com slash webinars 